So I get to welcome up Dr. Shane Morris to the stage here. And as he was introduced just a tiny bit earlier, he is the COO of Systemic Formulas. He's also one of our formulators. He also has been in this industry since he was 15, 14 years old. Um, he's not 14 or 15 anymore, which means he's been in it for a while. And the only thing I'll say about how long he's been around here is he's older than me, so whatever. <laughs> and he started a lot earlier than me. Okay. So it began about 27 years ago, his journey into the nutritional supplement industry. And his early training in found foundational and manufacturing and product development projects ignited his passion for natural products. He achieved his first formal natural products training in 1995 when he received his BS in chemistry and microbiology from Weber State University. After receiving his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Utah, he joined a world-leading nutritional supplement company as the vice president of R&D. In this executive capacity, he returned to graduate school for his MBA from Utah State University. He also joined Weber State University as an adjunct professor to continue his research in nutritional genomics, resulting in a number of publications and patents, and he's got more on the way. Six years ago, ah, well, actually, this is what, eight years ago. This is an old bio. You need to give me a new one. Eight years ago, he joined Systemic Formulas, where he continues to pioneer natural products in areas like nutrigenomics, epigenetics, and has created a field called herbalomics. And that's actually one of his newest patents. As a new clinical nutrition specialist, he works with practitioners to help systemic formulas create more effective nutritional herbal products. He's also the very proud husband to Amy and the father to Mikkel and Cambry, which are little dancing fanatics that are awesome. So without further ado, let's welcome him up to give you the debut of Neurosyn. <laughs> that just is hard to get used to. Um, okay, so this, I'm really excited today because we have some amazing speakers that have already gone. Thank you very much. And they've really prepared us for what is coming next. Now, although my talk focuses a lot on, a, it, it's product-centric, right? It's nutritional-centric. It applies to all the clinical learning that you're doing throughout the weekend. And, and before I forget, because I usually do it at the end, but I want to do it at the beginning, I want to thank everybody that not only has played a really important role in product development, so you have uh, myself, Stu, um, Dr. Pompa, Jack Tips, Tim, Dr. Barston, and many others. We get to be up here, we get to tell the story, but I really want to thank um, the people back at Systemic, the people holding down the fort, because those of you that knew Grandpa, he was also an energy healer, and those of you in the room that are energy healers uh, need to know that one of the people that make our product, his name is Mike, he has been making it for over 20 years. So he is making our products just like Grandpa made the products. So he was trained and has consistently upheld those values. So whether we introduce a new product or whether we are making the original products for you, um, Mike is still there doing that. And with Mike, of course, there's many other team members. I can't name them all, but you might meet Charlie, you'll meet Spencer, Mark. Uh, those of you going on the tour will meet many of them. And then we've got Cast and others. So I wanted to thank them because, again, we get to be up here, but they are so important to the process, right? They all care. They all make it happen, um, even though we get to be the, the, in the limelight. But they are great, great people that have done that and have done it for a long time. And so that's, that's what I want to know. So we uphold the values that Grandpa instilled in all of us, all the way through Lana, Stu, and to this younger, new, well, we're old now too. Nicole and I are getting older. Um, so that being said, let's um, kick this off because I was really, this is a humbling experience. Those of you that have really thought about what it means to think about the brain, right? So as you've come to these other intensives, as you know what, look at our product lines, um, as you deal with cases in your life, 
uh, your patients, you have, you know, we worry about so many of life's processes, the liver, the kidney, um, we worry about the GI, the microbiome, things that keep us alive, right? Those have always been important to us, things that keep us alive. But where do we live? We live in our brain, do we not? It's an amazing place to live. Without it, all those other things are just accessories. Emotion. We have happiness, emotion, dreams, love, nurture, uh, creativity, everything that makes your life part of your life happens via the brain. Now there, you know, philosophically speaking, there's other connections. There's connections to your heart and clearly to your GI, but the brain, this, this amazing organ, is so important to life. And I think it's neglected, and I think others would agree that uh, when you think about health, uh, you think about things that people have trouble with, how often do we go directly to the brain? And at the end of the talk, and I think Jack will do more, I want to briefly allude to the fact that we've been trying to heal over the last couple of years with the microbiome science that's emerging, right? And now we have the virome, and we have the oral microbiome from Dr. Curatola. We've been working on the GI up, but honestly, we have to now look at things in a more broad perspective and go GI down and meet somewhere in the middle. Maybe we meet three quarters. But we now have the tools to go from top to bottom as we were going from bottom to top. Any of you the guys that have had cases that haven't been resolved working on the GI tract from bottom up, right? This could be the reason. The reason could be right here, right? It's an important, important aspect. So what is it that our brain can do for us? Well, I, I just wanted this as an illustration. There's so many fun illusions, optical illusions or brain games you can play. And um, Cynthia Hoppen Cole, who's going to speak later, is going to have so much fun with you guys because brain games are not only fun and amazing, but they are like exercise for the body. They are like exposing yourself to the world for your immune system. In fact, imagining yourself, if you were locked up in a dark room, minus all sensory inputs and chained to where you couldn't move. That's what it's like when you don't have your brain functioning. It needs those inputs. It needs that sense of community. It needs what essentially, nutritionally speaking, this product will speak to is it needs what are called neurotransmitters. They are the things that exercise the brain. They communicate the exterior world, visual sense, smell, emotions, eye contact, pheromones. They communicate that to the brain and then that allows the brain to then send messages back out to the body and live and be excited and to enjoy everything, right? We want to thrive. We don't want to survive. So the brain has this amazing capacity to do all of these things for us, and, and we want to make sure it's healthy. Ultimately, if it's not healthy, you might have things that show up, and it's really the brain responsible. So this is a fun little picture. Back to illusions. So hopefully everybody sees that. Illusion, it's, you know, two trees that have some branches, some birds, uh, some leaves, of course. And I know you've seen many other versions of this. And really what I want to illustrate is the brain can see and perceive things like that dress this morning. And you can interpret it how you want, right? We all know artists. We all know imaginary people. We all know mathematicians, engineers. They will perceive something differently, right? You can show them the same thing. And their perception of it is different. Well, that's what makes us us, right? Just like our microbiome is unique, our brain is unique. Everything about it says something about your past, something about your ancestors, something about the experiences that have come through the many years of your ancestry, and as well as the experiences that you have from childhood to adulthood. Your brain forms, it gets creative, it makes new connections. And as we'll learn today, one of the challenges we have with the brain is we used to think of it as a static organ, right? We used to think of it as once you've got your brain, you know, how many times have you heard the commercials or your parents or someone say, hey, don't drink or do drugs because if you kill your brain, you never get it back. Now, that's good advice. I'm not 
negating the advice. However, we now know that isn't true. We can rebuild the brain. We can rebuild neurons called neurogenesis, and we can rebuild connections to existing nerves that haven't been damaged, right? That's an important new discovery. And throughout my talk, I hope that you can see discoveries. And I'm going to present a lot of, similar to Dr. Curatola, what we know that we didn't know even 10 years ago. And the tools, and many of you guys are really, you have tools in your office. Well, tools that we've now developed, like brain scans, have revolutionized our thinking of the brain. Revolutionized it. Revolutionized emotion. Revolutionized nutrition. How many of you here have patients or have had patients that suffer from either cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, etc., or anxiety, stress, panic attacks? Okay? Now, tomorrow we'll get into the second. We'll get into stress and anxiety. But not only do you have patients, I bet many of you have personal experiences, family, friends, and I know I do. And this is a critical, critical issue. And as we age, it begins even younger than I am. But because your brain is so amazing, it tries to stave it off for as long as it can. And then there can be a precipitating event, whether it's an amalgam, whether it's a toxic exposure to PCBs or pesticides, and so on. It precipitates, and then we're rebuilding. We're no longer preventing, we're rebuilding. So the brain is amazing, and I tell you, it was humbling. And even before I got up here and was thinking about this talk and thinking about this product and all the things that I needed to say and I'm not going to be able to say in an hour, I thought to myself, you know, I need to take the product I'm going to talk about before I can talk about it because I need it. I need that nutrition. So I did. I took a bunch of the product that you now have on your desk, I hope. So it's an important niche for us. So today, we're going to talk about um, how our brain and cognitive improvement. Tomorrow, I'm going to present mood enhancement, right? That's the, set, that's the different product. But in cognitive improvement, I'm going to go through a few things. Here's my outline. So we're going to do some learning. Now, I know for many of you, this will be review. For those of you that have done some work in the brain area, this will be somewhat of a review. But for others, I just want this to reinvigorate the idea that we have an energy-based system, but we also have a physiology, biology-based system that nutrition needs to be placed into, so the learning can be applied across the board, whether you retain all of it or not. It's important to know because the formulas themselves are clinically studied, and the ingredients are clinically studied, and so in order for me to communicate the clinical history and the clinical efficacy, we go through the process of the brain where they may apply clinically to the brain, to the neurons, to the neurotransmitters, and so on. So we learn a little bit. And then we're going to go into the threats, and you've already heard a few today. And then we're going to do nutrition and neurotransmitters. These are like the guys that exercise the brain. If these go bad, then we go bad because they are essentially the exercising of the brain, the communication, the sensory world. So they, they send messages back and forth. That's where things go wrong, I guess. Let me put it another way. When things go wrong, they go wrong here. Okay? And then finally, we want to talk about how we improve it, and there's a little bit about gut-brain connection. So let's get right into this. So I don't expect you to memorize this by the end of the talk, but by tomorrow we'll have a quiz. But most of you guys, you've seen this, right? We've got occipital lobe, we've got the parietal, temporal. We all see these, we all talk about these uh, in many discussions about the brain. This is the, the area of the brain that really can make a difference, right? We carry a lot of emotions, it's our, it's our sensory inputs. Then we have, on the next slide, we'll go back and forth, we have the center brain, right? This is where um, pituitary, pineal, thalamus, hypothalamus, and we used to think of, if we go back to this one, back, you know, we used to separate right, lane, right brain, left brain, and there's true, there's two lobes. If I were to have a top view, you'd see the half. And we used to think of people as right brain, left brain. Turns out that women debunked most of that now. So although you have, you know, the, the left brain controls the right side and the right controls the left side, we used to think, you know, you're creative or you're logical. Studying women's brains, they have something that's called a corpus callosum, that merges the two, they can do things on both sides, right? They can be logic on one or on the other. 
Now, men, you know, we're working at it, but they really have debunked some of the old thinking. And, and, and how did that come about? Well, brain scans. You know, you, you put, put women to task and measure their brain using a scan. You can see all this activity on both sides of the brain. Okay, it's amazing. It's beautiful. The hippocampus is responsible. It's in the center, too. It's responsible for some of our memories. And it's also, so there's the corpus callosum I mentioned. But the hippocampus is curious because that's where things flow through the brain stem, right, through the spinal cord from the world about. And they, they stop there. And if you guys have ever thought about an image or a memory or a smell and how that becomes a short-term to a long-term memory. Well, we think it happens somewhere there and then, and then goes out to the cerebellum, right? And the cerebrum. Sorry, cerebellum, cerebrum. So the hippocampus is really a curious place. And that's where we discovered, less than 10 years ago, I believe, neurogenesis. So the hippocampus is growing new nerves. New nerves were being formed there, and we never thought that that could happen in, the, in our brains, right? We thought you got what you got when you were a child. But back real quick. So, and we're going to talk about a few, few things, and especially when you guys think of the gut-brain axis, remember that the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that goes from the brain to the, the GI tract. Now, it also touches the heart, the lungs, right? It's not just strictly to the, to the GI tract. Okay, the vagus nerve connects right in here, the medulla, right? So that's where it comes into contact with the brain and sends all of its sensory. And that's a bidirectional world. So when we talk about GI, and I, and I think, like I said, Jack will touch on this later, it's important to think that it goes right into the thick of things, right? Right into where it needs to be which is why memories and things. How many of you guys have been nauseous? You caught that really terrible flu. Okay, that's a memory now, isn't it? You remember what you felt like when you didn't feel well because it shoots right in there and it has full access to those memories. I don't, didn't need to bring up that memory. Sorry, it's a bad memory to bring up. My bad. Um, I, I, let's, before I move on, let's think about good memories. Um, all the childhood things, all these, you know, your first soccer game or your first goal or your first art project that you won a ribbon on, you know? You can remember so many things about that, and those are all stored. Think about that. That's all in here somewhere. And you can see the vision of it. You can see the image. So you can recall smells and images and, and facial expressions and, and experiences. This is an amazing, amazing thing. I almost need to sit down thinking about it. I didn't take enough product. Okay, so cells of the brain. So we have our neurons. But we also have what are called astrocytes, oligodendrocytes and microglia. These are all glial cells. So when you guys think of the brain, you used to think of it as just a bunch of neurons, nerve cells. Turns out it's way outnumbered. Okay, nerve cells are important. There's about 100 billion of them. But there are many, many more of these guys right here. Many, many more. Probably in the order of 10 times as many of these kinds of cells. What do these cells do? Well, just in brief, astrocytes, these form, these, if you look at an image of the brain, whether you're looking at a, uh, I think we even saw one earlier from Dr. Curatola, if you look at the neuron, in between the neurons are these astrocytes. They're more star-like, kind of, they have a lot more of short tendrils, not the big axons that nerves have. They are essentially what you would imagine. They help structurally support all the brain, right? So they keep everything in line like scaffolding. They also reach into gaps, what are called synapse gaps, and they help clean up when you have a synapse fire and you have a neurotransmitter release, they help suck the transmitters out of there. They have ways to clean out that synapse so you can do it again, so it can recharge itself. Um, they, do, they support the blood-brain barrier, so they interact with the endothelial tissue and the neuron so that they can help transport nutrients to the neurons. They supply the neurons nutrients. Right, so it's an amazing thing. Oligodendrocytes, okay, they, their main function is the myelin sheath. Have you guys heard of that? Right? And we have the most amazing myelin sheath. It's not solid along the nerves. And this was, for me, this is revelation. Again, it's, it's way more than we need to know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, it's the my, these myelin sheaths are, so, that, so if we look at the sheath, there are these cells, and there's a little gap between every one of them all the way down a nerve. And you can have a nerve that's the length of your body, right? Well, on that axon, they leave a little gap in between. That's so you can transmit the nerve impulse faster. It jumps from opening to opening. 
so it can travel closer to the speed of light. If they were covering the whole thing, it would slow it down. How brilliant is that? You know, you guys always hear me say how brilliant we are. Here's another example, right? That goes beyond, like, physicists couldn't have predicted it. You know, we can extend it, but how cool is that, that it, it's already there for us to take advantage of, right? Um, the microglia or glia cells, microglia cells, okay, these happen to be an important and very important um, immune system in the brain. The brain isn't, doesn't have access to a, our immune system like everything else because of the blood-brain barrier. So, of course, it has to have a built-in immune system. And a point that I wanted to make uh, that Dr. Cole, or Dr. Curatola brought up that was really, really amazing is, one, when you talk about mercury, um, he mentioned the mercury, and it turns out, I didn't know this, he just told me that mercury in amalgams tends to be methyl mercury, and I didn't know that. I thought it was just amalgamated mercury with another metal. It's not methyl mercury, which is a lot more dangerous. But even if you're exposed to what for a long time is considered less harmful mercury, remember the little mercury you put in your hand? You know, I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid, that was okay. You know, I remember being in elementary school, hey, look, you know, that wasn't a good idea, mind you. But back then, no one knew better because they thought that was harmless. Well, it's less harmful except unless you understand the microbiome. There are bugs in our gut that when they're exposed to mercury, metal mercury, they'll convert it to methyl mercury. They're desulfibrio organisms is their name. I mean, that's hard to pronounce. But they'll convert it. So those people that say, well, you know, metal mercury is not that bad. Uh, 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 you know, let's not go down that road because your microbiome will make it, convert it. And it's true for many, many toxins. So the argument is null and void when you're talking toxins, and I think Dr. Curtola made that point. Your microbiome will change things that you don't want. But these guys, so this is a really important point that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on later, but I want to point out that when you mentioned the oral microbiome, the GI, and Alzheimer's, this these guys play a huge role in that process because they are initiated, their inflammatory response is initiated by what's called lipopolysaccharide. That's something that dangerous organisms in the mouth that we're, you can keep in check secrete. Have you guys heard that? It's called LPS, you see it? When that makes it into the brain, these become activated. When these become activated, you create an inflammatory cascade, and if you have a chronic mouth issue, these guys are always, always activated, so you're now dealing with chronic inflammation of the brain, and you may not even know it. So, so then that leads to protein secretions, and here we have, now we're going down the path of dementia, Alzheimer's, and many other things. But I wanted to point that out, because those are the, the immune cells that are triggered by that, one of the ways you can trigger, and that's what he was referring to, when that, to relate our mouth to our brain. And then we have epidemial, um, these, these cruise around in our cerebral spinal fluid and, and so on, and they're really cool. They do a lot of different jobs. We won't spend any time on them today. The other reason I'm showing you guys all this is because these are the kind of things we want to support nutritionally and herbally, right? You've heard the word herbalomics, maybe. If not, I'll try to get into it. But we want to support those things with things that nature has given us over the millennia, believe it or not. So let's take a quick look at this. So stroma is the body of the cell. You guys have all seen that. We've drawn them. So these are more complex than the other cells you've seen. But again, this is, imagine this is the circle part of the cell. So inside you see the nucleus and all the other organelles. There's mitochondria. So that's the cell, OK? Well, neur neurons produce these little dendrites. And then this is the axion. And then these are the myelin sheath. And then this is the synapse. So there's the presynapse. That's where the one cell is going to touch the next, almost touch the next cell. We'll get into that second. But my point is here, when we look at the cellular formulas, when we look at the OX, OX formulas, OXCC, and so on, remember, they all act on the cell, in the cell, right? This is where our mitochondria is for e energy. This is where membranes take place. The membranes here, the synapses, are critical. That's why things like Vista and Omega fish oils have shown dramatically amazing clinical results. We'll get to a little bit of that later. But when we're looking at e-energy or Vista or um, oxidative damage, we're talking in this part of the cell again. 
So neurons are no different than the rest of your body, except they have a few cool appendages, right? They're taller, they're longer, they're lankier. Information comes in on this end. So this is the things that are usually sticking out towards the skin or in the eyes. And it's transferred down this way. That's how it works. And then that's how you transfer information. And it's called efferent or efferent processes, okay? Um, that's a long project. Now let's look at a synapse really closely. So this is where one axion is going to come and meet the next cell. Now remember, these aren't touching, and they don't want to touch because they're transferring a signal. You don't want a signal transferred. By touching, the signal just keeps transferring, and that's called a chronic state. You don't want them touching. You want them spaced out, so there's control there. But on the synapse, again, these are membranes, and these are receptors. How many of you here have heard us talk about membranes and receptors? Okay. We get back to VISTA. We get back to eEnergy. Again, we get back to um, CVO, BFO. We've got a lot of products that we've talked to you guys about that deal with membranes and receptors where these guys come into contact. The product we're talking about today works on some of these processes, especially where this synapse sends out neurotransmitters to this one to perpetuate the signal. And those neurotransmitters, we'll get into them, if you block this or if these, if we have problems here, then those signals die. Now what happens if these signals don't keep going even when there's nothing wrong with you? The nerves die, right? The brain shrinks, you have less ability to sense your world, to fix your world, to pick up on things, to have emotions, creativity, and so on. This is where we got to keep the health right here. So that's a synapse. This is a, just a cool picture. Um, and it's how we make memories. It's how we, it's how we live our daily lives, how we live in life. So this just picture is just to remind me that I wanted, if I don't emphasize it enough, that as we look at this part of our body, this is where we need to give it some attention, right here on these synapses. They're an amazing, amazing thing. And even if you don't want all the minutia or the detail I'm giving you, I want you to remember, burn into your memory, that the synapse, like other parts of your body that you want to, whether it's your microbiome, you want to exercise, your immune system you want to exercise, your muscles, your insulin resistance through burst training, your ketogenic, whatever it is you think you're exercising, we need to do that right here. We need to keep these things active. We lose these things with age if they're not kept active, right? All of you, I know all of you have experienced in your family or in your clinic, the process of aging and brain plasticity and memory and recalling things. In fact, how many of you walk into a room, you've got this idea and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, stomp into this room. <laughs> Dang it, what was I in here for? You go back to where you were hoping to trigger the same memory. But if, but if, these, these, aren't, if these guys aren't firing quickly, that memory is literally lost. When these things are firing, you can actually place it into longer term memory, right? But when these aren't firing efficiently, they, you don't do that, and it's literally lost in the synapse. Um, you know, you could probably write a book about that, lost in the synapse, I don't know. But I do it all the time. I mean, I just did it the other day. I went downstairs, and uh, I wanted, we had a, I had a drink. I had one of my, it was actually a kefir, you know. I'm looking at this drink right now. A kefir. And I, I put it in the fridge. I'm like, so I stand down there, and everybody else is in the rest of the house, right? And it's not in the fridge. And I yell, who took my drink? It was in a white bottle. And all the kids and everybody, we didn't touch your drink. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And so I walk over to the pantry to get something else, and guess what's in the pantry? My drink. I accidentally got busy or lost my mind and set it in the pantry. Fortunately, it wasn't that long ago, so I don't think it had really actively fermented. So we, we do those things, and the older we get, the more we do it, because we, we have to keep our brain active. And again, another message is I'm speaking to you about nutrition, but Cynthia's going to talk to you about the exercise and the brain games, and Dr. Crotola's mouth. I want you to... And I think Dr. Pompa said this too, we bring it together. It's not just one thing. So moving forward. Past my synapse. All right. So what are neurotransmitters? There's excitatory ones and there's inhibitory ones. Um, 
they're responsible for so much of our world. Now, the, the ones in red are the ones we're doing today and, and now. The ones in blue we'll do tomorrow, okay? So excitatory ones, they're responsible for memories, right? They're responsible for our uh, being elated, getting ready for a test. And, you know, last night I had a lot of excitatory ones going on because I knew I was coming up here and so on. So excitatory ones, if, they out, if they're out of control, do we have a problem? Yes, we do. Right? So there's the balance again. Just like the microbiome, we want to achieve a balance. We want to achieve a harmony. Uh, the other ones we want to learn are these guys right here. This one's important. I won't talk about it today, but circadian rhythm is so critical. Sleep is so critical to the brain. Right? And I'm guilty of this. Your brain needs sleep. Bottom line. Okay? Motor skills. Uh, when we talk about the, the vagus nerve, okay, there are... Um, vagal sensory nerves to our smooth muscles in our GI tract. We have to keep these things stimulated. We have, to, we have to stimulate the vagus nerve so that it keeps our GI tract moving, right? And there's ways to do it. But it's the same thing with the heart. And, but the GI tract is important because that's our second brain. So these motor neurons, um, vagal sensory motor neurons, we have to keep those stimulated. And I don't know if anybody's going to talk about it this weekend, but there are ways to stimulate the vagus nerve, right? And, there, and, and, it, and it shows up in our mouth, right? There are places in our mouth, in our palate, in the back of our throat. Um, and, and I know many of you experienced vagal nerve stimulation. Who, who uh, has been in a jet and had a jet go upside down? Okay, I haven't either. I'm just kidding. But there are other things you've done, like maybe go to a lake and jump off a little cliff or right in a roller coaster and you get that, whoa, dizzy, vertigo, plus a little nausea. Okay, that's vagal nerve stimulation. Or, or you cough really hard because you have you know, a, a bad cough and all of a sudden next thing you know you're nauseous. Vagal nerve stimulation. I'm here to tell you that vagal nerve stimulation is a great thing, not a bad thing, right? Because it sends those messages to the system to keep it moving, to keep things updated, just like your central nervous system, keep the synapses active. Okay, our second brain and our endocrine system. This would be a great subject for some time down the road. Uh, in fact, we are going to be talking about the endocrine system in the fall, in case you guys didn't know. The female endocrine system is our next intensive, right, after sunshine. I know I should be telling you about sunshine, but endocrine system is a critical part of this. Tomorrow we'll spend a little more time on it. But our second brain, anybody here not know what the second brain is? Yeah, if you wouldn't raise your hand, sorry, that's a terrible way to ask a question. Poor students, you do that in the class and you know a student's going to raise their hand and like, they just whisper to their friend, what's the second brain, right? It's the stomach, right? No one's going to honestly, say, I wouldn't either. It's, it's, it's all the GI, we, that vagus nerve, it's the second largest nerve bundle to your um, spinal cord. It goes down into and covers the entire GI tract, touches the lungs, the heart. It's huge. It's in a huge nervous system that is responsible for communicating the brain in the, in the gut back to the brain in the head, okay? It's critical to this entire conversation. Everything that's good for the central nervous system that I'm talking about today is good for the vagal nervous system. It's good for the second brain, okay? Point made. Um, six classes of neurotransmitters, acetylcholine. Um, it's unique. This one helps in memory. The, there's amino acid ones, right? Gamma butyric acid, GABA, glycine, glutamate, aspartate. These down here tend to be excitatory. This is inhibitory. This is excitatory. And so there's ways to look at them. Anybody heard of oxytocin? Yeah? Throw me out. What, what, what have you heard of? What does it? What does it do? Love. So you guys have been reading up on this. Um, that's a new development, right, with brain scans. Uh, those of you in a relationship, no matter what kind, um, whether you're in it for a week or years, these things change. Did you guys know that? They've scanned the brain of people that are newly in love, newlyweds, newly dating people. And their brain lights up in these amazing regions with these types of endorphins and neurotransmitters. But as you, as you age and as you're married longer and longer, the entire look of your brain changes and <laughs> it starts to match your partners more too, right? So there's this really cool dynamic, right? It's actually a beautiful thing. Unless, you know, there's, 
we won't get into marriage counseling or any of that. No, I won't even go there. There's probably times that it doesn't match and it doesn't play out the way I'm saying, but that's not for here. Let's, let's stay on the positive people. Positive. Uh, monoamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, histamine. Okay, epinephrine, what's another word for that? Adrenaline, right? So that's excitatory. Fight or flight. Dopamine, serotonin. Serotonin is actually inhibitory most of the time. That's, that was amazing, right? I mean, we don't think about that. And then we have lots of other ones. There are over 100 neurotransmitters. These are the main, most active neurotransmitters. The other ones have very unique functions we're not even going to touch today. Um, but purines, adenosine triphosphate, so, so on. These, there's some amazing things in nature that we have. And then there are gases, nitric oxide, hydrogen sulfide, cannabinoids. You know, that actually ends up as a gas in some cases. So what do they do? Well, this little overlapping map is just a, a summary for you to think about, and you can refer back to it later, especially when you're talking to a patient. You're, you're thinking about what they've done. You might have given them a questionnaire. You might have applied, you know, one of your pieces of equipment to them. You may have uh, applied, done applied kinesiology, blood testing, whatever you do. This little map is decently good, and there's many other versions of it. But when you look at this, so dopamine is much enjoyed as a pleasure motivator. Did you guys know that that's the main receptors that those drugs bind? When I say those drugs, you know, drugs that you should be scared of. You know, cocaine, meth, and so on. They bind dopamine receptors. Right? That's, that. that's why they go, keep going back to them. It's why they're so addictive. Right? And then your body, what does your body do? So in the beginning, in those synapses, it's saying, excellent. You know, we've gotten this drug binding. It's firing these synapses. Your brain lights up. You're, all these things, right? And then you keep going, and what does the synapses do when you are overstimulated? Remember I said too much? Your synapses start to repel a little bit. They don't like it. They, need, they start producing as many receptors in between that synapse. They start sucking some of those receptors back into the synapse because they're saying, hey, if you're going to keep flooding me with neurotransmitter um, via the drug that you're taking, I'm going to start raining back on the signal transduction, and then what do you have to do to up your feeling. Take more and more and more. And now you move a synapse from the brain all the way into the brain and now you're blunting these in the brain. And then the neurons start to die. And one of the things the brain scans have done and I know there's nature does provide some important um, compounds for us to be used medicinally. I'm not going to argue that. However, long-term use of anything that binds to these neurotransmitters does have of an impact on the brain, okay? Scans have demonstrated that no matter what, no matter what it is, natural or not, when it is a drug that impacts the brain, it does have an effect on the brain and starts to kill certain spots of the brain, right? And if you use it long enough, it, you look like a stroke victim. There are huge gaps in your brain, huge holes of dead neurons, okay? So you may have these people in your, in your um, database, your patients that are coming in that are addicted to things. Alcohol has a similar outcome. So it's important to know that. So you've got attention. So imagine now you take these neurotransmitters, which are so important to life and thriving and all of our positive things we talked about. Now when we turn the tables and start looking at challenges that we might have, you know, um, dysfunctions, diseases, and so on, look where they start to really impact us. Anxiety, impulse, irritability, mood, cognitive, attention, appetite, sex, aggression, right? These are all... For living life, these are all important, aren't they? To be happy, to be productive, to be, to do what you do, these are things that make it worthwhile, right? These are compassion, these are empathy, these are relationships, these are community, these are being in love, being in, in doing things you love, whether it's skiing or um, lecturing or whatever. These are the areas that you are going to gravitate to every time, right? Which is why they're also so problematic when they go wrong, right? They're debilitating. Well, and actually some are there, right? Obsessions, compulsions, um, so on. So I'm not gonna spend much time on this. Needless to say that this is a beautiful, beautiful little guy that these are our little neurotransmitters, right? So that's like acetylcholine, and these are like our receptors, right? And this one happens to be, there's glycine in the middle, um, there's GABA, they bind to these little guys and they move the information along the synapse. You guys have heard of minerals, right? We're mineral depleted. I'm talking about 
the neurotransmitters that move things along. Minerals play a part in this. When you cause this to happen, minerals are released, calcium is released, um, sodium, chloride, right? Those things are released to move this along. When you've depleted yourself of those things, and I know Dr. Pompa and Dr. Cole, Dr. Um, Kuratola mentioned this, that's a problem. You may have good neurotransmitter, but now you're lacking minerals to have proper nerve function. Too much. I know that graph was pretty, pretty in-depth. Um, neurogenesis slows dramatically during late gestation. So there is a point where you don't make a ton of new neurons, but under the right conditions, we can. And with the right nutrition, you can. But it does slow down. Your brain fills up during gestation. You have tons of neurons. They're overbuilt, right? I don't know how we could keep them. There might be ways. We have no concept. We just know that during gestation, there's a peak, and then they start dying for the rest of your life, right? They start shrinking. They get trimmed. They, get, they atrophy. They, when new connections are made, the guy that's in between has to be taken out, right? Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death, okay? That's just another stat. It involves the hippocampus. It involves many other things, but the hippocampus, I wanted to pull that out because, because it involves the hippocampus and because we know that we can create neurogenesis in the hippocampus, what do we have? We have ourselves an opportunity, do we not? Okay, we have an opportunity. And I wanted to put that there to, to point that out, okay? Hippocampus grows new neurons, that is a fact. We can start dealing with these, these problems. Memory decline starts by age 50, that's kind of scary for me. AD will decrease, it's increasing 30% in 10 years. Inflammation is a, a major cause, we talked about that. Neurological decline, there are so many of these, I just threw a few on here. Um, these are not only um, symptoms, but they're things you can use to measure, and I'm going to get to some of these later, but high blood pressure, sometimes we don't think of that as a neurological, we think of that as a cardiovascular. Well, they're connected, right? And it can be, you can be getting the wrong signals being sent to the cardiovascular system as part of that. Um, let's see, depression, anxiety, autoimmune, things that you guys know about um, in spades, uh, risk factors, we talked about this today, insulin resistance, type 3 di diabetes is a growing piece of information regarding our brain and brain health and Alzheimer's and so on. So I wanted to put that up here. That's a very important part. If you don't know a lot about it, look into it. It's still an important aspect. Everything about the brain we can cover in the things we've taught in the past and the things we're teaching today, right? Because they are just cells. They are, they, they have the, we have the ability to go in and help them, each and every one of them. Everything you have in your body can be done. You, you all came from one cell, okay? And it was copied and copied and copied. So we can fix these things, you guys. We can fix them, right? Except, and these guys, they didn't come with your single egg. They might have, though. You know there's a new theory? We might have, we might have microbiota that came along with the original egg and sperm. I said it, right? There might be. There is some evidence. It's really, really cool stuff. Uh, and, it, and again, it comes back to women. These dang women, they have everything. Um, and some of the evidence that's leading us to that conclusion is women have a microbiota in their breast tissue that had to get there via early, early, early. It couldn't, got, it couldn't have gotten there anywhere any time later, right? It's the coolest thing. Sorry, I, I digress. Um, so there's things we can do. We've got mitochondrial support, dysglycemia, neurotransmitter balancing, burst exercising, microbiota, dietary intervention, and brain games. Um, so, as I've been mentioning all the way along, we have opportunities in all of these places, right? We know we can work on the membranes. We know we can work on receptors. We know there are herbs that talk to our genes. And if you haven't heard me say that before, that is what we at Systemic call herbalomics. In fact, that is one of the most important things about herbs, right? I know we love them to cook with. In fact, I think that's a dying art, and I think it's being rejuvenated, but, you know, four herbs in your cupboard is not enough, you know. 400 is more like it. And I've told you guys this before, but your ancestors ate more herbs than they did food, okay? And I don't know how nerdy you guys are, but if you read nerdy books, even something as nerdy as like Lord of the Rings, you know, J.R. Tolkien, 
when those little hobbit guys are traveling across the world to save the world, they're picking herbs as they go, and they put it in their stew, and they put it in the rabbit. That's real. That is what we, that's what is important. So herbs talk to our genes. That is critical, and I keep hitting my button, apologize. And then enzyme cofactors. Enzymes are the, the workhorses of our body. We have to support our enzymes. Right? That goes without saying, but they're everywhere. They do all the jobs in our body. They're what the genes make. Genes make enzymes. So it's very important. So guess what? We have opportunities. Opportunities in this world trump the opportunities that the drug world is giving you by tenfold, if not more. I mean, I, I just made that number up. It's, I know it's higher. And because of the new technology, because we can do brain scans, because we have access to our brain to see what nutrition is doing, whether it's herbal nutrition, whether it's um, what we call nutritional nutrition, right? Things like amino acids and precursors to um, enzyme products. We can change the brain. In fact, this is one area that medicine is going, wait a second, these guys had it right. Brain scans are responding nutrition so much better than they're responding to drugs. Did you guys realize that? Do you guys know that? Okay, they are. They're, one of the guys I'm going to talk, or I've, I've referred to in my talk, and there's a lot of guys doing brilliant brain scans, but Dr. Amen, and it's spelled A-M-E-N, he started it. He started with love, right? He did a love book. That's how I met him. Um, but the brain scans, he's done over 100,000 brain scans, and he's the first person to say, ginkgo biloba. Don't know why, don't know how, but when I scan people's brains on ginkgo biloba, it's a beautiful brain. It looks like a teenager's brain, and the guy or the woman is 50 years old. And then he has also now started um, different clinical studies on football players. So he's done over 300 scans of football players that had concussions, okay? And these are retired. So these guys, they're scanned, and they had huge holes in their brain from concussions. That's brain damage, right? And we know it's serious, trauma to the brain. And those holes in the brain essentially mean in a scan that part of the brain is dead. Well, he started them on these programs using things like I'm going to tell you about today, and those brains started to heal. Okay? This isn't um, speculative anymore. This isn't even hypothetical. This is real. We're seeing this happen. And what we have today in this product is we've taken all that knowledge, and, and granted, I'm grateful to a lot of these people that are doing the research. It's not just us. That we can, we can glean from that, and we can combine things that are not combined. So... I have to put that in there because it really is. I know, I, uh, you know I'm not a salesman. I don't want to go to that. But you can't get what's in Neurosyn in less than five different products. I've looked. I've had Ian look. And, and by the way, Ian's been a champion of this. I didn't mention his name earlier because I was waiting until now. But he has a particular love for this particular product because it's personal to him. He has his own personal desire to affect his brain in ways that he's wanted to over his life. So he contributed to this process. And if you don't know Ian, he's walking around. I think his tag just says Ian. Um, and those of you that know him can point him out, you know, make fun of him. He's pretty good about that. But he also really wanted to see this come to fruition because for personal reasons. And he's helped me look. There, most everything in this product has some really good clinical backing, but we do have a few unique things. We are systemic. We spend time looking at ethnobotanical histories. Ayurveda and Chinese medicine happen to be the most prominent areas that Neurosyn has. Now, that isn't a mistake, I don't think, from their standpoint, but when you dig deep into their literature, into their healers, they have things they've used for thousands of years that we now can explain using brain scans. So how cool is that? So they were, if they were alive today, they'd say, ha, I knew it, we were right, but they would say it in Chinese, right? So we go back and we look at those things, and that is a lot of what's in this formula, and then we have a lot of modern ingredients. So we've, we've bridged again the gap from ancient to modern and tried to combine the two. And you can't get that in any single product. So I'm standing by this. Um, there's no equal, I'm standing by that too, and I said that already. And then it is a large dose, so I apologize for that, but it's a double lot capsule, it's packed full, but in order to meet all the requirements that we want to meet, looking at what we know about the brain scans, we want, we had to give you a lot of product. So minimum four to six capsules a day, 
with, with someone that you have truly tested and diagnosed with you know, some issues. You can go lower than that for people that are recreationally using it, like you know, myself, but otherwise, you gotta up the dose. And again, I, I wanna thank everybody that helped do this, you know, the Ions, the Bombs, the Jacks, the, you know, the systemic staff, and so on, because this, was, this, is a, this is a work of love, a labor of love. It really is for all of us, and I wanna give everybody credit, even though I get to stand up and talk about it. So I wanted to kind of illustrate Neurosyn in a way that we can relate to it a little bit better because I know it's a very heavy subject and it was for me. Um, so nutrients for SNPs, what are SNPs? SNPs are mutations in your genes, right? So we had to look at that. You can have predisposed mutations in these, trans in these neurotransmitters in the making of them, in the transforming of them. Um, how many of you guys have heard of things like L-DOPA versus let's say tryptophan or tyrosine, right? We can make most of our amino acid neurotransmitters from the building block amino acids, but there are some people in your database in this audience that cannot do that. So what do we want to do? We want to look at the plants that provide the next step, the step beyond that enzyme that is broken or not working properly, okay? Does that make sense? So we go, we do before and after so that we can cover those patients that may have mutations. Those are called SNPs. We have neuroprotection. That is a huge thing. Oxygenating and protecting from free radicals makes all the difference in a brain, okay? So there's that there. We have neurogenesis. We have compounds that have been studied and clinically shown to do neurogenesis. Now, I've mentioned it's mostly hippocampus, but now there's some studies that are looking more in the cerebrum as well. So it's gonna be really fun. This is a burgeoning world for us because of the tools we now have. Before, we couldn't look into that into our brain, right? We had to examine it from afar, examine it um, through emotional work and through questionnaires and things of like that. Now we can do both. Neuroplasticity, that's something we're, we're also interested in improving. Acetylcholine action, that is for memory improving. Neurotrans neuromembrane and receptor sensitivity. And then finally, we wanna balance both the excitatory and the inhibitory neurotransmitters. Now I'm gonna stop right here. I'm gonna go to the next one and show you where some of these things are. And you'll notice some of these things are Chinese in origin. Some of these things are Ayurveda in origin. So it's kind of fun. And I've only shown a few here. The label's much bigger. But they go to those places. They mirror the one before it just as a, so I could catch you guys up. Uh, and by the way, we mentioned GMO and Systemic is listening to you guys. Systemic is, is going through our product line avoiding GMO, avoiding um, gluten, avoiding those things that trigger the issues that we fight, right? We don't want to be missing things. And so as we did that, this phosphatidylserine, guess what the source is? What's the normal source of phosphatidylserine? Soy lecithin. So, we're, so we didn't want to, I mean, come on. Do we want to do that? No. So what did we do? Sunflower. Yeah, that's sunflower phosphatidylserine. So that we don't contribute anything that we don't want to contribute to the process. Um, really fun herbs. If you guys get a chance to look into these, I love these things. They're amazing. Um, but one of, the, one of the things I want to point out here is, as we look at this, I want you guys, and, and this is a request to each and every one of you, especially those of you that, in, that see a lot of people in this world, please give systemic feedback. Once you get this in your hand, once you you, under, you understand and recognize the energy of it, and then you want to start using it, please give us feedback. Please say, hey, this seems to be a little too excitatory or a little too inhibitory, or give us feedback. The brain is nothing to be trifled with. Okay, we've done a little bit. Like I said, Ian has been um, excited about this, so we made a pilot product, not this complex, about a year ago, and got some good feedback through some people. However, going larger, please give us feedback. It's gonna make all the difference in the world. The brain is so important that we get it right, okay? And this is true for today and tomorrow. All right, neurogenesis, I should mention. It's a generation of new neurons. We increase collateralization. Has anybody ever heard of the collateralization? I mentioned that. That is where existing neurons reach out and make new connections to existing neurons. So you don't grow new, you don't grow new neurons in this respect. You collateralize, you make more fingers out there to touch. Where have we seen this the most? How do we know most about this? Unfortunately, war has given us a lot of information in this area because of brain damage, right? Trauma to the brain, 
in really, really catastrophic ways. And yet, they can rehabilitate, they can get a lot of function back, they can get a lot of things back through collateralization. So your brain is amazing if given the right tools. Uh, neuroplasticity. So again, collateralization helps, learning helps, okay? So I'm getting back to the brain games. Cortical remapping, this is really cool, response to the environment. Your brain is highly tuned into life, so it's really sensitive to everything um, around you. It's sensitive to the smells, and so we have to be super, super, super alert that it will not respond in a short amount of time like your stomach may to an infection, but it is actually in, under assault. Right, whether it's the mercury, whether it's the organic xenobiotics and, or the microbiological or what have you, it's not going to tell you because it doesn't have the tools to tell you. It is actually trying to keep you informed of the rest of your body. Right? It actually doesn't have a lot of tools to inform you about itself. Think about that. It has its own immune system. It's isolated in, a, in the blood-brain barrier. It isn't always going to be warning you. Right? How many of you have seen or had in your family or in your practice, brain tumors, right? They don't always show up via symptoms until sometimes they're large, depending on where they start, because your brain doesn't have that mechanism. It's, it's busy telling you about everything else, about your life, about your relationships, about your feet and your hands, and right? So it's busy. So please think about the brain and, and take care of it. Uh, so we want to make sure it's not exposed to the bad environment, for real. Uh, improving memory, recovery from brain damage, that is part of the reasons we know about neuroplasticity. Uh, which is an amazing thing. So the brain scans I've kind of touched on, but you can go look at them. There's so many now, doctor, there's so many researchers, both in the natural and allopathic world, both healers, and a lot of them, is so, it's so beautiful to see they're becoming more interested in healing because we have the tools. Once again, we have the tools that they don't have. So, and they, and they're, they exist in all these places. The nutritional and herbalomics and neurological advancements were... We're on the cutting edge, but we want to stay there because it's important. Again, I need your feedback. It's so important that these herbs that are interacting with our brain, do you think they just started interacting with our brain because I'm telling you about this? Right? Because I'm telling you they do? You think that's all of a sudden they just started interacting with our brain? Oh, heavens no, that was a ridiculous statement. They have been interacting with your brain forever, with your ancestors' brains, with your depending on what continent you're on, you're visiting and the food, and the, they have been doing this for you forever. We just haven't been able to appreciate it. Okay? Now we can start to appreciate that world so much better. And I know I'm running short on time, so let's look at some protocols really quickly. I did this. This is a starting point. You're going to get more from Jack. You're going to get more from Dr. Pompa. You're going to get um, Cynthia, I'm sure, is going to cover some really fun things on the brain. I wanted to throw this out there because this is essentially the, I don't know why I lightened up the first one. This is essentially a protocol that mimics the studies that have shown brain neurogenesis and brain improvement in either traumatic injuries, um, concussions, all those things I've talked about the studies. This is what they were done on minus these last two, okay? So in those studies, they want to control for things like sugar. The omegas are clearly important. E-energy, which has things like your CoQ10 and some of those nice mitochondrial pieces. And then the neurosin. These last two I want to touch on. I'm going to cruise through that because that's our gut-brain axis that we're interested in. So here we go. Let's talk about that now before I'm done. So if we want to, if we want to understand it better, have you, did you guys realize, and maybe some of you haven't, haven't, but... And I threw this in there, so it might not be in your book, but stimulating the central nervous system to prevent intestinal dysfunction after traumatic brain injury. There's many, many, many examples of this in literature now. Again, it's less than a few years old. Guess what this means? When you injure the brain, you create leaky gut. Did you guys know that? That is a fact. When you injure the brain, you create leaky gut. What is the sister to leaky gut? Or brother. Blood-brain barrier opens up, right? The same proteins that open up your gut open up your blood-brain endothelial tissue, right? The, what do we call the tight junctions? Do you remember that? So, we not only have a connection through the second brain, through our vagal nerve, 
that, that drives all these synapses and all this communication from the microbiome and, and the immune system, the GALT, to our brain. We now know conclusively that when you injure your brain, you're now re wreaking havoc to your second brain. Okay? So we cannot go without this little fact, and I wanted to hit that, even though I don't get to spend a lot of time on it. So guess what? I am a firm believer in the big approach, right? Here's the things you need to do for your brain. I've talked all day about nutrition, however, physical activity, burst training, by the way, is by far the best. Those of you that don't know what that is, it's an easy one to look up. Burst training is the best for the brain. Uh, mental stimulation, the games, you'll get more of that. Spirituality, right? Meditation, prayer. Your spirituality is part of you. Do not neglect that either, right? Nutrition, I just talked about that this whole time. Socialization, that is critical, right? Some of us are a little more introverted than extroverted, but socialization can be just with your partner, right? Exploring goals and things and wishes and dreams and travel, and that's so critical in your brain health. All right, five steps. This is the verbal part of what I just did in a, in a graphical, okay? So there's more to come this weekend. I'm really excited. And then here's some tests, and I want to actually jump. So steps is right up here on the deal, right? We have symptoms, test, evaluation, protocols. Now, here's some things you can look for, right, in symptoms. Short-term memory decline, tremors, um, lower blink blinking frequency. This is, this is take home for you guys. All this, all this stuff I've given you, this is the stuff you can take home. This is stuff you can write down or highlight in your book. Increased irritability, loss of balance, capillary refill. Does anybody know what capillary refill is? Right? Squeeze, let go. That's really slow, right? Now, there's a heart component to this, and those of you that are really big in the heart world will get this, but it's still neurological in nature as well. Leaky gut, because I just told you about leaky gut. And then neurotransmitter tests. If you do practice functional medicine, they're, they're getting better at the functional medicine tests for neurotransmitters, okay? It's getting easier. It's becoming less expensive. Um, even though they're a snapshot, you can do them, and, they, and it is critical. Uh, here's some Parkinson steps. Now, this is, this is a gift from Dr. Barston. These are very unique, and I wanted to throw this up there because, again, it's a neurological issue, but I wanted to give you guys some take home. Smell and identity. Right, so you walk into the room and give someone something to smell. If they can't recognize it right off the bat, red flag, right? Especially something as common as what I've listed up here, coffee or peppermint, you know, something they should always be able to do. Dual tasking, walking and counting. This one, be careful because, you know, I don't know how many times people texting walk into walls, right? I mean, I think there's a whole YouTube sensation of texters doing things that used to be driving. I'm walking texters, right? Walk through a plate glass window or... You know, walking into traffic in New York. I mean, it's texting is, you know, well, I'm not sad. So be careful when you do this one that they have their focus. Finger tapping, right? Right, you go down, one, two, three, four, five, and then back up. It's kind of hard over the left hand. I got problems. Pull test, slightly grab from behind, right? They're standing, you pull them, and if they really lose their balance, okay? Uh, stand up, walk around from a chair, and then I guess the, the neuro test. These are the two best that I've found in case you're interested. One's called Cyrex, one's called Labrix. Um, they're taught by other people too, but you can look into them. Here's my a lot of references for you in case you wanted to see some of those. And then I want to thank everybody.